Okay. Okay, um, welcome to everybody uh, to our first webinar of the season, Paddling Emergency Preparedness. Um, we've got Vern Fish here um, to present for us today. Um, he's had lots and lots of experience um, and preparation for uh, paddling emergency. So he's got a, a lot of uh, storage to share and information to share. Um, I would ask that um, you mute your uh, uh, mute your sound um, and um, keep it muted throughout the presentation. But uh, in the chat area, you can uh, chime in with questions. We're going to be monitoring that, but we'll probably save up everything for the end of the presentation uh, because this is being recorded and we want to uh, use that as one solid thing. So, okay. Uh, without further ado, Vern. Hey, good evening. Thank you for everybody for participating. As uh, MJ indicated, uh, I, I got got into this because I had to do a series of emergency exit. And the one that really got to me was when I had to have to fly myself out because I had a, a health issue in the middle of nowhere. So I, I've taken this pretty personal. I don't, I'm not gonna claim that I've got this all figured out, but I've tried to pull in as much material as I can. So I think you need to look at this as a, as a starting point for your own thoughts and procedures. and. The, uh, the the real bottom line here is, are you ready? Are you ready to deal with what's going to happen in the field? And kind of the, I got to give you a little background as to why I do this. There's a couple of guys I've done some paddling with, Dan and Ray. And I, I do this, and I think this little little quote really sums it up why we get out there in the backcountry, probably why you get out there in the backcountry. There's a magic in the feel of the paddle and the movement of a canoe. A magic compounded of distance, adventure, solitude, and peace by Sigrid Olson. Uh, I, that, that remoteness is part of that adventure, but that remoteness can also be a downfall if you're not prepared for the worst that can happen. Um, this is another little piece of why I go out there. Yeah, this, this is why I stare at maps, read books, Put food in the barrel and plan for trip just so I can have a couple moments that look like this. We're the only human beings out here right now, other than a couple of goats over there on, on the uh, river right. We got the place to ourselves. You might be able to watch this on the Discovery Channel, but very few people actually get to go out and play in it. So that remoteness, though, is a factor you have to take into consideration. And I, I think that's the reason we do these adventure trips is to be able to see mountain ranges and caribou and run whitewater uh, and sometimes do this kind of stuff. And when you think about it, think how dangerous that is. Uh, the guy in the front there could very easily bust a leg and how in the hell are you gonna get him home? So I keep asking the question, are you ready? Here's another example. What, what you're seeing is a boat being pinned and what you can't see is that every piece of wood in that boat was broken, every seat, every thwart, and we still had 70 miles to go home. So you'll see this boat at the end of the presentation, but yeah, did anything break? Everything broke. Are you ready for that? Have you ever had to deal with a serious injury on a canoe trip? Have you ever been truly lost? If it breaks, can you fix it? Have you ever had to make an emergency or a non-emergency exit? Do you carry a whistle and are you prepped and ready? Well, as MJ said, I've been very fortunate. I've been able to run wild rivers from the Mexican border to Hudson Bay and north of the Arctic Circle. And then the five, last five years, I've had to do one emergency and three non-emergency exits. And one of those non-emergency exits was for me. So are you really ready? I'm gonna start out with a premise here. I was very fortunate 
that I got a chance to paddle with a mentor. His name was Jerry Storm, lived up in Cook, Minnesota. And he drugged me all over North America. I got to go places I'd never imagined I'd ever get to go. And he had a motto. Every morning, we'd get up and he'd look at everybody and he'd say, hey, let's not do anything stupid today. And so part of what I'm going to start out with is what I think is the obvious stuff. So let's not do anything stupid. Uh, the Coast Guard has some numbers. And I think these are kind of a, a good indicator because if you don't think it can happen to you, well, it can. Uh, kayaks are the have the second highest fatality rate and uh, with 44 uh, percent, 96 fatalities while uh, kayaking. Uh, there were 46 fatalities while canoeing, 18 fatalities while on stand up paddle boarding. I don't know how the hell you can die on a stand up paddle board, but there it is. Here's the one that really gets me. 81% of fatal boating accidents drowned. Of those victims reported, 83% were not wearing a life jacket. So think about that. If you're gonna die in a boating accident, it's probably because you drowned. And more, 83% of the time is because you're not wearing a life jacket. And then here's the other piece. Oh yeah, so bottom line is, I don't care how good a swimmer you are, and I don't care how close that life jacket is, when you need it, it won't be there unless you're wearing it. Wear that life jacket. And then here's the last, the other piece. Alcohol is a leading cause uh, of accidents. So when I say don't do anything stupid, let's let's not let's not paddle drunk. Let's no alcohol. Let's wear our life jackets. That's the first two things. Let's put that at the top of your list. All right. The most common requests for search and rescue are errors in judgment. All right. If you take a look at this boat. I think you can rattle off a long list of errors in judgment. First of all, how many of them have a life jacket on? Second of all, what's the capacity of that boat? There's only one guy paddling. Uh, there's just all kinds of dumb things happening there. No life jacket, The uh, too many people in a boat, not enough paddlers, doesn't look like they know what they're doing. That's an error in judgment. Fatigue. Fatigue is a high percentage of problems. You paddle too far, too long, you just start making, you start doing st stupid stuff. My brother used to call it being stumbly tired. You're just so tired, you don't know what you're doing next. Insufficient equipment and experience. This sleeping bag sitting on a log was a community college class. The student was in one of my classes, took him to the boundary waters, didn't have enough clothes with him, which is partially, partially my fault, but he was so cold that he came out to breakfast in his sleeping bag. So obviously, insufficient equipment. Falls, uh, you can imagine there's all kinds of ways you can fall. Climbing is one way to do that. And weather. This is the classic example of a hypothermia. You get cold and wet. I don't care how big and strong you are. If you start to shake, you're in trouble real fast. So those are common requests for search and rescue. And as the, uh, an author by the name of Charlotte has put together the three strikes, the three blunders that'll get you in real trouble according to search and rescue experts. And I'm gonna play off of that as far as what I think you need to be thinking about. Let's start with the first one here. Be prepared or being unprepared. And the way I, I wrap that is expect the unexpected. Do you have a first aid kit? Uh, are you wearing your life jacket? Uh, do, you, do you have that gear with you? Should also know what the weather is. Do you know what the weather is? Do you know what the tides are? If you've ever been uh, on the uh, in the Everglades in South Florida, you, you got to deal with the tides. If you've ever been on Hudson Bay, uh, there's an eight or nine foot tide. You got to be aware of that. So you got you got to know that stuff. That's being prepared. Here's another example. Do you have the right equipment for the weather? Do you have a tent that can handle twenty to forty mile an hour winds? If you're out on the on the tundra. You got to have a, this is a cooked custom tent, a Tundra tent. I'm happy to advertise it for you. But that's one of the few tents that I've, I know that you can set up in a 40 mile an hour wind that'll keep you protected from the wind and the rain and allow you to cook. Can you tell my story of trying to get my tent open this morning? Go for it. The zipper was closed. <laughs> we had a hard frost that day. The sheriff was closed, the, the oil was stiff. I don't even want to think about the flood. But thank God, thank God Dan got up and did stuff out. It's a cold morning on the lower table. That's the other thing that a cooked tundra tarp will do. It'll give you a warm place to be when you're on a cold day. So lack of training is the other one to get you. 
uh, education, get some. Take a paddling course. Take a boating safety course. Take your on-water skills training. Uh, you need that kind of training. You need to have people, you know, we all think we've learned something by being out on the local river, but have you learned from an expert? Have you really been trained? Lack of training is critical. Uh, this is an example of my first community college trip. I took a kid twisted his ankle. And what I realized is I hadn't packed a first aid kit with me. So, you know, that, those are the kind of things that, that really come back to haunt you. Have, have you. have you got the training you need to be out there? Uh, I now have gone through the National Outdoor Leadership Wilderness Medicine Program. And not only have I been through it, but I've kept my certification up. This is actually my third certification. And I think that's another challenge is the training that you're taking, are you staying current in it? And, and here's a reason why. Hey, Dan, why are we standing out here on Highway 6 in northern Minnesota? This is Highway 5. Highway 5. Why? Well, I was lost earlier, too. <laughs> um, we just uh, brought all of our equipment up from our campsite um, after a pretty long night. We had a uh, person in our party get uh, lower abdominal pains on a real severe level. What, at, at what, what time? About 10.30, um, right after we'd all gone to bed and wrapped up everything. Uh, anyways, he, he ended up having a lot of problems with uh, vomiting and very convulsive vo vomiting. And the pain was on his left side. Not So we, we had to try and figure out a diagnosis, try and figure out what direction he was going, better or worse, and whether we were going to be in terms of an evac or whether we were going to be able to treat him overnight at what we were at. Um, but at, within 45 oh, minutes, that's what I was going to ask. How long did it take us to get to that conclusion? After about 45 minutes, we did we did a rough assessment on him first, just checking for any kind of bulges, bruising, or anything in his abdominal area, getting an idea of what he had been eating, bowel movements, urine. Um, we found that he had not had a bowel movement for five days. Um, not critical in my book, but it's abnormal. Uh, anyway, we, we worked through those things. We really didn't find a sense of what was, all that, that pain was radiating in that spot. And it wasn't getting better. It was getting worse. And his vomiting was more convulsive. Um, with that, started some, he is bringing up bile and blood. And so anyways, we made that conclusion that we had to do an evac. At that point, we had the satellite system, the inReach, that our leader was able to communicate back to a angel that did all the phoning for emergency uh, vehicle to come out. We were lucky that we were within a quarter mile on a service access road from our campsite. So we had an, an really an easy evac compared to what we could have been at. Our next campsite was a very isolated one, uh, would have been a terrible bushwhack. This, we were able to, we had a lot of options going for us. By 1230, we had our patient out to this spot right here and loading into an ambulance. So the response time on the ambulance was great from Big Fork. And uh, they were able to take him right into the hospital. Um, that was a, that was our evening. What we've heard so far is um, we think um, he had just a very ag aggravated constipation, kind of a uh, yeah. I don't, I don't know. That's, that's it. Yeah. yeah. So, but the point is, we got him out. We made the decision. We got him out, and hopefully, everything is going to be okay. Yeah. Thank you, Dan. Here I am, sitting on Highway 6, northern Minnesota, Big Fork Rivers, off to my left. Again, uh, we had an event last night. Uh, you already heard from Dan about the details, and a lot of what he did came out of his Noel screening, which was pretty important because they teach you how to deal with emergency backcountry uh, medicine. And so a lot of that came into play between the two of us, but Dan really has the expertise in that area. Uh, the satellite phone was a big part of it. I can't, I can't say 
enough times how important it is to, to have some sort of communication back to the real world and in, in reach was invaluable. Uh, he made reference to a guardian angel. That was Dennis Mullen in Mesa City, Iowa. Uh, was able to get a hold of him, uh, gave him uh, enough vital s statistics on what was going on and told him that we needed to evac evacuate and evacuate now. He was able to look up, made all the appropriate phone calls, and then we, we emailed back and forth on the updates. Uh, and it's, a, it's a little chaotic, but it, it's a valuable tool. And if we did not have that means of communication last night, it, it, the situation could have uh, unfolded in a much different manner. So satellite phones, nor, uh, National Outdoor Leadership for, uh, Wilderness First Aid Training, we're all critical and having thought this kind of stuff through, you know, what are you going to do on your trip if somebody in the middle of the night starts puking up coffee grounds and can't go to sleep? What are you going to do? You got to be thinking about that kind of stuff. So just to give you a sense here, th this is kind of hard to see, but this is a transcript of the uh, uh, text messages by inReach that went back and forth between myself and my guardian angel. And that was Dennis Mullen in Mason City, Iowa. And again, we woke him up at 1051. Uh, first question I asked him, do we have an emergency? Are you available? Uh, yeah, he says, I am, I can, I, yeah, I'm here. Uh, how can I help him? Uh, and he's looking now, he's looking at where we're at. He knows exactly where we are. We're 100 yards off a road. Um, he's tracking that. Vern, don't leave me hanging. Keep talking. See, we're in the busy of diagnosing what's happening. And Dennis is starting, you know, he wants to know what's going on. So here's the follow-up. 1030, uh, D started throwing up, severe pain in the waist, low, low fever, needs to be taken out, call for help. We can walk the road and let us know when to start. And what I'm telling you is we need an evac and we need it now at the road. Uh, he's got the uh, EMS on the way, can't confirm when it's here, called ambulance. They'll call me back, ETA, I gave him your, your number. Ambulance is on the way. You can text him if you want. And then we got him. Great. What else can I do to help? And my answer was, we're good. We'll give you an update tomorrow. All this is by, you know, two sets of thumbs on an inReach. And if you've ever, ever worked with an inReach, it's not that easy, particularly in the middle of a rainstorm, 1030 at night in the dark with mosquitoes all over the place. So here's an example of a of a, uh, another guardian angel. Oh, wait a minute. Back up. Hey, Jill. In uh, Elizabeth Falls, Maine. Uh, uh, we spent the morning working on maps and uh, why did I have you, why did I give you all these maps and why did we spend time talking about the trip? I am their chauffeur up and back and if they need help coming out early, I'm there to drive up to get them and bring them back home and rescue them. Yep, and so you're gonna keep track of us on the whole trip and we got maps and, and gadget gears and all the necessary information. So that you can keep track of it and come get us if we get in trouble, which happens occasionally. Yes, but we're not going to have any trouble. We're not going to have any trouble, but you are my guardian angel, Jill. Yes, All right. I am. Thank you, Jill. Yeah. So, do you have a first aid kit? Do you know what's in it? Um, does it conform with uh, anything that can happen while you're out there in the field? For example, and have you done the training that goes along with it? And, you know, we talked about the evacuation decisions that went, went into evacuating that, that young man in that situation. And, you know, the, the stay column, uh, if you if there's no threat, if you're able to support them, timely recover, expected in the field, you know, stay. It's a go. And particularly in this case, condition uh, warranted uh, and definite medical care was needed for patient recovery. We made that decision that we couldn't take care of that person. Um, and this is the 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 soap I made reference to earlier when people were, were coming into the into the presentation. This is part of the Knowles training. Basically, what they want is a summary of the who, what, and where. Then the vital signs, all all the stuff, and the, like there's some initials in there. A level of response, of response, uh, heart rate, respiration rate, skin uh, color, temperature, and moisture. Uh, that's part of your your sample history. And then finally, you should be, have your treatment plan put together. That's the kind of logical thinking you should go through when you're trying to prepare in, in a situation dealing with a patient that may have to uh, be evacuated or not evacuated. Um, the other the other issues that the search and rescue people have identified is inexperience and complacency. Paddlers with less than 100 hours of experience make up 74% of the paddling victims. And even with that said, experienced paddlers 
with sloppy safety habits can become victims. And that's why they recommend established systems, habits, and checklists to prevent emergencies. So know your local situation, Have talk to lo the locals, uh, get all that in background information. But then here's my packing list. And you'll also notice that I update it regularly. And this is all the stuff that I think I need for a trip. And that includes group gear. And you'll notice in there, there's a pin kit. And that's how you get a boat off a rock, a repair kit, first aid ki a kit, uh, permits, poles, a throw bag. If I got uh, to go do a rescue. And I'll guarantee you right now, having taught community college kids, I haven't found a kid yet that can throw uh, a throw bag and get me out of trouble. I might be able to get them out of trouble, but I can't find anybody who's going to get me out of trouble. Um, and then life jacket. I carry on my life jacket a whistle, a knife, suntan lotion, camera, matches, and a satellite phone. If I get swept off my boat, and I have had that happen, I've got that stuff with me. And that whistle, I'll talk about that a little, a little more later, how valuable that is. But probably the most important thing I have is that satellite phone, because that's how I can communicate with the rest of the world. And it's clipped onto my life jacket, and that life jacket's clipped onto me. So if they come down as a packet, they stay on me. So that life jacket's critical. Wear it and have the stuff that you need on it. And then I'll talk very briefly about a cold water bag. But if you're in the far north and you get wet and you get cold, you're in trouble and you can be in trouble in 10 or 15 minutes before you're going you're, you're gonna to lose the ability to solve problems. You should have, where you can get to it, a, a bag with your warm gear that you can strip that clothes off, that wet gear off and get into dry stuff or that you can give to somebody else. It may not be you that's in trouble, maybe your paddling partner. So back to that life jacket, whistle, whistle, whistle. They're all, they come in all kinds of shapes and forms. But what do you use it for? How do you use it? Well, first of all, if you get lost, I can yell and scream till my voice goes, but I can blow that whistle for days. One blast of that whistle means I'm here. I'm just telling people I'm here. And I've had people get lost on, on portages. I mean, I've had multiple people get lost on portages and they start yelling and screaming, and then they get hoarse, and I can't find them. Blow a whistle. One blast, I'm here. Two blasts, I'm over here, come get me. Uh, I can't move or whatever, but two blasts, come get me. And then three bl blasts, I'm in trouble, and I need help right here. So that you should have it on you, and you should be able to, uh, the rest of the people in your party should be able to communicate with that whistle. Yelling and screaming is a horrible way to communicate. It's a recipe for disaster. That should be on your life jacket. It should be attached to you. Another part of that organizational scheme, and this is where the what the guardian angel needs to have. On all my trips, I have uh, a planner form. It's got all the contact information. And when you look on here, you can see that my email address is on there and also my inReach email address is on there. There I am, all my contact information. So if my guardian angel back home needs to tell Barb my emergency contact that I there's there, there's a reason I'm coming home late that he's got that the guardian angel has that contact information and every everybody on the trip is on the is on the uh, planner sheet and in this case the outfitter is on there so I can communicate with the outfitter and then there's the guardian angel and again the guardian angel has all this information at their disposal so they if something goes wrong with uh, with Vern uh, they can let Barb know um, but also uh, they can communicate with the outfitter. Uh, it just gives you one person has all that information at their fingertips and they don't have to go look for it. Dress for immersion, not air temperature. Your body loses heat much faster uh, uh, when it's wet than when it's dry. And I'm going to give you a kind of a, this is just one of those little goofy things. It's the Storm Peterson uh, Moisture Index. And the two guys that kept me alive, my mentors, I always talk there north northern Minnesota. Hoop means you're in a bad situation and you're, uh, that's out of your control. Bone drying is that's what your bed back home feels like. Damp is when your ankles are wet. Soggy is when your pants are wet up to your knees. And soaked is when you're wet from the belt down. Uh, so when you're completely soaked, what are you going to do? Well, you got to get that stuff off. And you're going to pull that wet gear off and that bone dry sleeping bag, which is bone dry because you've triple packed it, is going to allow you to you know, either crawl in or put on that cold water bag. Uh, and what you really learn is that it's okay to be damp, but you don't want to you don't want to be soaked. And uh, if you get soaked, are you prepared for it? 
And again, you got to have dry clothes and a dry sleeping bag because it will happen to you. you know, at some point, you will be in hypothermia. And then the right shoes. I've been in hypothermia because my boots got, got wet. And it was 45 degrees, high temperature during the day, below freezing at night. I was hypothermic because my boots were wet. So do you have the right footwear on? Finally, pin boat. Um, this is something that we need to practice. Uh, there is a rope tie system using pulleys. I actually carry the pulleys. You can also rig ropes this way so you can pull a rope off, which you can't, hard to imagine. There's, there's a couple thousand pounds of pressure on that boat on that rock. You can't pull it off by yourself. And you may need a rope and a pulley to get off there. Uh, and that shows you the setup, how it would work with pulleys. Uh, but real honest, that, that's one of the flaws. One of the things that I haven't done a good job, my, I should have my, my crew practice before they go on a trip because we've, we've had boats get pinned. What's in your repair kit? And just a quick scan here. There's a, a utility tool, there's tape, uh, there's glue, there's patches. Uh, if you notice in there, there's shock cord for your tent poles. You ever had a tent pole fail? And if, you, if your tent pole fails and you can't put your tent up, you're in a world of hurt. Replacement buckles, there's a couple of tent pole sleeves in there that you can put in. Uh, what do you carry in your repair kit? Have you got what you need? Have you ever thought about what could happen on a trip and, and can you fix it? I mean, we've had holes ripped in a boat and had to put tape on it to patch them to get us get us home. Have you got what it takes to get that, whatever you've got that's broke, get it back home? Okay, so boat just finished a 10 day trip down the auto cruise. We've had some problems. Okay, we got the back seat. That, that's pretty well broke off, propped up with a board. The uh, webbing is gone, you know that. Right here, we got a thwart gone, and the other thwart's held in place with tape. And Dave did a very good job on that. This is what happens when you swamp a boat when you're trying to line. And then we got a little bit of damage. Hard to see. We hit a rock today. I took off the uh, skid plate, and she's pretty beat up. But she did a good job, and we'll replace all the damage and do her again next year. So let's repeat, going back to my, my mentor, let's not do anything stupid today. What are two stupid things you could do? Not wear a life jacket. And the other one is drink. So don't be mixing alcohol and paddling and always wear that life jacket. The, the next one, well, do you expect to pin your boat? No. So you got to expect the unexpected. Expect to have somebody totally tear up their, their big toe and all of a sudden they can't walk anymore. You have the right stuff in your first aid kit. Expect the unexpected. Practice your skills so that you can respond effectively when it counts. Do you know how to use your inReach? Do you have an inReach? Do you have a guardian angel back home who can communicate with you? And then establish systems, habits, and checklists to prevent emergencies. You know, again, I have my, my planner sheet with all the contact information and all the inReach uh, addresses. And then I got my uh, packing list. And these are just some of the examples of systems and habits and checklists that make you better prepared to deal with what you, is good, could happen and will eventually happen in the, in the backcountry. All right. That's my program. Um, what we will do now is, uh, is take questions. And uh, I guess I should shut off the Zoom. So give me, or no, not the Zoom. Let me shut off the remote if I can figure out how to do that. I'm looking for the um, questions right now. I'm not seeing. Okay. 